Welcome to Daily GRE. Today we're going to solve a dynamics problem. I have two students. Hello folks, my name is Rifat Bari. I'm a master's in physics student at Brown University. My name is Subono Isaac Berry and I'm a math and physics student at NYU. Consider a surface and let's consider a big mass. Let's call it big M. Let's consider a small M attached to the big M. Okay. And let's have some friction and let's call it the coefficient of friction and let's call it mu1 and let's have some friction between these two boxes and let's call mu2 what would be the minimum applied force so that remain static right now we're trying to find the amount of force horizontally required to keep uh, this small mass right over here m Talks that this is true, the small mass stationary. Now you might be thinking, well, Saburo, that's not possible because obviously this is being pulled down by gravity and this is a horizontal force. It's not going to push anything up, right? So that means that this is going to fall no matter what. But I'm here to tell you that's not true. So how are we actually going to do this? Well, it all has to do with the coefficient of friction on the surface, mu2. So this is the force of friction, and it's our upward force, and it directly relates to this applied force right over here, which, which we're going to say has a magnitude f. So first thing we have to do is state the obvious. Force of friction is equal to force of gravity. But what do we do from there? Well, let's look at a free body diagram of the small mass. So. You might remember from basic regent physics, wait, you guys are regent physics students, but you might remember from basic regent physics that if you have just like a mass resting on a table, you have Ft and then an equal magnitude Fn over here. This isn't an action reaction pair, of course. But you might be thinking, well, Saborno, it's not like the force of gravity is going directly into the bigger mass, so there can't be any Fn back. And I am telling you that is actually incorrect. Fn is a contact force, so you see this big fat area of contact right here? Fn is going to get exerted for all of that. So we have this Fn, which I will denote F block because it's not the same as the Fn, Fg. And that will get confusing because by Newton's third law, every, every, every action has an oh, equal and opposite reaction. So if I push on the blackboard, it puts its back on me. So that's how, how the whole principle of recoil works, uh, along with propulsion and a bunch of other things, all fueled by Newton's third law. So, that means that there's also going to be a force block this direction with the same amount of magnitude. But we're getting off topic here. So, essentially, we have FF. You might remember from basic region physics that FF is mu2 Fn. And Fn here is going to be Fb. And Fd is mg. So, you get Fb is equal to mg over mu2. And you might notice that Fb is actually the only forward horizontal force on M. All the other forces are in the vertical axis. So, that means that Fb must be the only source of horizontal acceleration which, from what we can tell, is the only kind of acceleration that's supposed to be going on here because it's supposed to stay at rest vertically. So that means that A and the, uh, this FB has to be the net force in the horizontal direction. So A is just FB over M, which is G over mu2. Now the thing is, if the acceleration of the big mass and the small mass were not the same, then that means they just separate from one another. And that would look stupid. And that's especially not what we want to have here. Because if they separate from one another, there's no force of friction to keep the small mass up, so it'll just drop to the ground. 
catastrophic. So that means that the acceleration of the small one has to be the same as the big one. So that's going to be very useful. Now, let's draw a force body, uh, free for hat, food body diagram of the big mass. So obviously, there's the force of gravity, big MG. Then we have the force of friction up here. Wait, no, that's the small m. We don't have the force of friction up there, in fact. We have the force of friction right over here. Now you want to know, wait, no, it's not that way. It's this direction. Now you want to know why? Well, in all those classical friction problems where you have a mass sliding on a table with friction acting the other way, think of it from the table's perspective. From the table's reference frame, it's like the mass is exerting a force on it, which is causing it to slide in the opposite direction. Actually, that's from the block reference frame. But. So, that means that the table actually experiences an FF that goes this way. The only problem is that we imagine the table is an unmovable, immeasurable, inex unexistent, blah, 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 object. So, that means that we treat this FF is non-existent. But since this is another tangible and even moving object, we have to actually consider the FF in the opposite direction. So that's why this is extremely important. So then we have FF, well, no, just the applied force, F this way, and that's it. No, I'm just kidding. Then we have, as you know, the normal force and F of the block in that direction. That's five forces. That's enough to count on my fingers. Wow. So, now we only really need to talk about these two in the horizontal direction, because that's where all the acceleration would be actually taking. Oh no, I forgot a sixth one, this FF. This guy was about to scream like a banshee if I forgot that. Okay, oh, I mislocated the line on the F. So, we have, what is FF prime anyway? Well, it's equal to mu1 Fn. Mu1 is relatively mundane. So let's move to the problem of what Fn is. Then we have to get tangled up with the vertical forces as well. So, we know that Fn, well, you remember those classical problems as well, right? If you have a mass, then Fg, and then Fn of this way exerted by the table, and you exert an additional force downward, then what does that do to Fn? No longer just mg, it's mg plus f. Because if you added nothing at all or something less than f, then it would go straight down through the table because of the unequal balance. If you added something greater, it would start flying up. That doesn't seem natural, does it? So to stop any vertical acceleration, we add exactly plus f. Stop making confused faces in the back over there. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So we have mu1 times fn is just big mg plus ff. All right? Good. So then we just have f block to talk about, which as we know from before is mg over mu2. And then we have the applied force f. So we have f. Mm, the total acceleration of the system, so m plus little m times a has to be equal, well, the acceleration in general has to just be equal to g over mu2. So that validates my claim if we take f minus fb, ff prime, sorry, minus fb, divided by m plus m, the mass of the entire system, is equal to the acceleration. Now, let's actually talk about this. So, we have f, we already know, that's just assumed. Well, we have to actually find f, that's the variable. Then we have ff prime, which is 
uh, mu 1, yep, mu 1 fn, where fn in this case is just md plus ff. Mm -hmm. And what is ff if not little mg minus fb, which stands for Facebook. No, I'm just kidding. So we have fb, the force of the block, which is obviously just mg over mu2, divided by m plus m equals z over mu2. So now let's multiply both sides by m plus m to get f minus mu1 g. Trust me, factoring out this z will definitely be helpful later. m plus m minus mz over mu2 is equal to, never mind, this is just a regular m. Whoops. Well, yeah. Did I just break it into more pieces? Now I broke it horizontally this time. What is this bad luck? So yeah, now that makes a little more sense, because now we're just considering all the forces on big M divided by big M itself. So we have this is equal to mg over mu2, which gives f equals mg over mu2 plus little mg over mu2 plus mg mu1 plus little mg mu1. So that's just g times m plus m plus mu1 plus 1 over mu2. And that we've seen enough of the NYU explanation, also known as the incorrect explanation. Let me show you what the correct explanation looks like. So I'm going to give you an intuitive understanding of the problem. So let's uh, first try to understand what the problem is. So we have two boxes. One is a big box of mass capital M and one is a small box of mass little m. And there's a coefficient of friction between the big box and the ground and a coefficient of friction between the two boxes that keep them from falling apart. So this is the friction that keeps this small box from sliding down and hitting the ground. So what we need to find is we need to calculate the force applied to the big mass so that the friction between these two boxes is sufficient to hold this thing from falling down due to gravity. So let's try to understand how to solve this problem. So before I try uh, solving this problem, I'm going to write down two things. They're going to seem very obvious, but we're going to be using them again and again. Okay. First is Newton's second law. Okay. Newton's second law. So Newton's second law says that the net force acting on an object is equal to the mass times the acceleration of the object. Now, this might seem obvious to you, but in this problem, we're going to apply it in a different way. We're going to find the acceleration of the small box. In this problem, we're going to find the acceleration of the small box. And then since we know they're going to move together, this box, the big box, also has to have the same acceleration. If they have different accelerations, they'll either move apart or collide into each other. So after we apply Newton's second law to the small box, we'll find the acceleration, apply that to the big box, and then find the applied force necessary to keep the friction sufficient to keep this one from sliding down due to gravity. So that's uh, the first thing we're going to need. And then the second thing we're going to need is something you also might have heard of. Newton's third law, okay? Newton's third law says that every action has an equal but opposite reaction, okay? And we're going to see that we're going to see that in action, uh, no pun intended, in solving this problem. So let's go ahead begin our solution. So to solve this problem, you need to do a very few steps. We're just going to draw a picture of the forces acting on the big box and a picture of the forces acting on the small box. So let's draw that picture right here. So here is the big box of mass capital M. And here is the small box of mass lowercase m. 
Now, I'm going to draw the force pictures at the same time so I can illustrate these two laws in action. Okay? Now, first thing is pretty easy. Let's draw the force of gravity acting down on both boxes. Capital MG and lowercase mg. Okay? So far, so good. Now, we also know there's an applied force on the big box. Here's that applied force, F sub A. Okay? What else do we know? We know that since this big box is sitting on a table, there has to be a normal force, uh, F sub N. Okay, there's your normal force. Okay, is there anything else? Well, we know there's a friction, force of friction between the big box and the table. So let's draw that friction. Now, this friction is a contact force acting between the big box and the table. So I'm going to draw it right here. Okay, gravity acts from the center of mass. But this friction acts between the table and the box. So this is the force of friction acting on the big box. Okay, so so far so good. Now, we also have another friction, a friction between the two boxes. This is the friction between the big box and the table. Now, we have a friction between the two boxes. Now, we know which way does this friction have to act. We know gravity is acting down on this box. So the only way the friction can act to keep it from falling down is straight up. So this is the force of friction on the small box. But now we apply Newton's third law. Newton's third law says every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Okay? So this is the action which is the force of friction preventing this box from sliding down due to gravity. This is the reaction pushing the big box down increasing its normal force. So the normal force of this box would usually just be mg. But now it's not just mg, it's mg plus whatever this force of friction is. Uh, F, F, R, lowercase m. Okay? Have we accounted for all the forces? Almost, but not quite. You see, these two boxes are touching each other. Whenever two things are touching each other, there's a contact force. Not only the force of friction, but a force that the two boxes exert on each other. So, here is the force that the big box exerts on the little box. But, we know that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So, the force that the big box exerts on the small box is equal but opposite to the force that the small box exerts on the big box. We are now done with our force pictures. Now we can write Newton's second law for each of the boxes. So the strategy is going to be writing Newton's second law for the small box first and then we can calculate the acceleration for the small box. We know the two boxes have to move together. So after we find the acceleration for the small box, we know it has to be the same acceleration for the big box. Write down Newton's second law for the big box and then solve for the applied force required. So let's do it. First, I'm going to write down Newton's second law for this one. So the net force is equal to mass times acceleration. What is the net force? Well, which direction am I looking at? Am I looking at the horizontal or the vertical? Well, let's look at the vertical here. In the vertical direction, there's only two forces. The force of friction, F, F, R, acting on the small box, minus the force of gravity. Okay? And this is equal to MA. Now, we know the coefficient of friction between the two boxes is mu2. So that means this force of friction here is going to be mu2 Fn. Okay? But what is Fn here? Fn is the normal force. But of course, here the normal force is the contact force between the two boxes. So this is equal to mu2 and the contact force is Fmm. Okay? So I'm going to write I'm going to write that down right here. So mu2 force of the big box on the small box minus mg is equal to ma. Okay, now uh, we know that for this box to uh, not slip, what does the vertical acceleration have to be? 
Well, these two forces have to balance out. Okay, these two forces have to balance out. So that means mu2 times the contact force uh, between the two boxes has to equal the gravitational force acting on this box. That means that the contact force between these two boxes is mg over mu2. Okay, using some very simple reasoning, we argued that these two forces have to be equal. Why? Because this box cannot fall down. And from that, we got the contact force between the two boxes. Okay, so now we are almost there, but not quite. Remember, what we have to find is the acceleration of the small box. Then we can say that the big box has the same acceleration. So what is the acceleration of the small box? The acceleration of the small box is simple. First, we applied Newton's second law in the y direction to find the contact force. I should write y, 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 okay? Now we're going to apply Newton's second law in the x direction for the small box. So the net force in the x direction is mAx. In the y direction, the acceleration had to be zero so, th so that the <coughs> box could not slip. In the x direction, there is, of course, acceleration because you have an applied force. So, what is the only force acting in the x direction for the small box? It's the contact force. It's the contact force. So, that's F sub mm is equal to ma. Okay? But we know what F sub mm is. We calculated it from Newton's second law in the y direction. So, let's plug that in. M g over mu 2 is equal to ma. Now you should write ax, ax, because this is the acceleration in the x direction. Okay, now notice that the masses cancel out and we can just, oh, oh, two minutes, man, two minutes. Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm a student, so I'm just recording a video, I'm solving a physics problem. Almost done, thank you. So solving for the acceleration in the x direction, we get that the acceleration is g over mu 2. Now, this is the acceleration of the small box. We know that the big box has to have the same acceleration. So let's go ahead and write down Newton's second law for the big box. Okay? So, Newton's second law for the big box looks as follows. So, the net force in the x direction is the mass. Now, this is wrong. I should be using the big box's mass, capital M, A sub X. Okay, so uh, what is the net force in the X direction? Let's sum up all the forces in the X direction. We have the applied force, F sub A. We have the contact force pushing back, the force of the small box on the big box. We have the force of friction acting on the big box. And all of this is equal to M, times the acceleration of this big box. But we know the acceleration of the big box has to be the same as the acceleration of the little box, which is g over mu 2. Now all we have to do is solve this equation for the applied force. So let's, before I do that, let me plug in our values. Do I know what the contact force, uh, do I know what the contact force between the two boxes is? Yes, I calculated it here, mg over mu2. Do I know what the force of friction is? Yes, it's just mu fn. But what is fn here? Well, I calculated it here, right? So fn is mg plus the force of friction on the small box. But what is the force of friction on the small box? Notice that has to equal mg, right? Because the two forces are balanced. So this is equal to capital mg plus lowercase mg. Or if I factor out the g, it's the total mass times g. So now, I can just plug that in. That's my fn. So instead of fn, I'm going to plug that in. That's m plus lowercase m g. Now here, we have to be careful. What mu is this? Well, this is the force of friction on the big box. So this is mu 1. And this is equal to capital M g over mu 2. Now I just need to solve for the applied, for <coughs> applied force. So the applied force is equal to, just move everything to the other side, 
Move this to the other side. Move this to the other side. Now I'm going to factor out g over mu2, g over mu2. So I get f sub a is equal to factor out g over mu2. You get m plus m, okay, m plus m. And then you have this term here, mu sub 1, m plus m, g. Now all we have to do is factor out this common factor, g, m plus m, g, m plus m. What do I get if I factor that out? I get the applied force necessary. I get the applied force necessary to keep, so I get 1 over mu 2 here, plus mu 1. And this is the applied force. So if you liked Brown's explanation, please leave a comment down below. If my explanation, then please leave a comment down below too.